Well, good morning to you all. Notice I'm using English now. <coughs> That's probably because my Spanish is uh, not quite as good as it ought to be. We're going to be talking about Adopt a Child and the work that we do, but first I want to put it in context. Because there are lots of organizations out in the world who do humanitarian work, who will go and help in times of emergency or do all sorts of other things as well. We come at it from a different point of view. We come at it from the point of view that these are people who need to know about Jesus. That is our primary purpose. Jesus, one of the last things he said to us was go and make disciples of all nations. Now the very fact that that was about the last thing he ever said makes it pretty important. And it doesn't matter whether those nations are Scotland, England, Wales, Ireland, whether it's Europe, whether it's South America, it doesn't matter where it is. We need to preach the gospel. But how do we do that? I think it was St. Francis who said, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. In the passage we had from Micah, he showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. It's not necessarily to stand on street corners shouting out to people about the gospel, though there's a place for that. But if people don't see the gospel in your lives, why should they listen to your words? People judge you by what you do, not necessarily by what you say. It's one of the reasons I love working with Adopt a Child, because for us, it's all about showing these kids and their families just what love God has for them. Get out my magic piece of equipment and hope it works. Okay, so we're Adopt a Child. We're part of another organization called In the Water International. <coughs> and some of the things that they do, for instance, are plant churches. But what are we about? We're about being a helping hand. We're not there to take over. We're just there to give a hand. And we have this motto, changing the world one child at a time. Because we believe that once you start working into the life of a child, you do change their world. I'm sure you all know the story of the little boy after a storm who was walking along the beach. And he just started picking things up and throwing them into the sea. And a man came along and asked, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm picking these starfish up and throwing them back into the sea. And the man looked along the beach and there were thousands of starfish stranded on the beach. And he said, you can't make a difference. And the little boy picked a starfish up and threw it in the sea. Well, it made a difference to that one. You see, when you work into the life of a child, you're working not only into the child's life, you're working into the mother's life and into the father's life and into the life of the family and the extended family and then the village and the ripples just keep on going. Because I happen to believe that even if Jesus had only saved one person by going through the agony of the cross, he would still have done it. That's how much God loves us. And we can do no less. And no matter how old the children are, they can be seven or they can be 70. They need to know that they're children of God. We work in uh, Guatemala, um, and we also work in Albania. I'm not quite sure why the Lord sent us from Guatemala to Albania, because they're hardly next door. But over the years, we've learned that when the so Lord says jump, you don't ask why, you ask how high. So when he said go from Guatemala to Albania, we did. And we're working with children in the mountains, we're working with children down in the slums, and currently... We're working with about 11,000 children in Guatemala and Albania. Now, those are the kids who are registered on the programs. Um, 
if they happen to fetch along a friend, we'll feed the friend as well. You see, when we open the programs, we open the doors to all the kids in the area. We don't choose who comes, they choose. How can we choose who's worthy of being fed? We just feed whoever comes. We think we're quite an exciting program. Um, you'll probably find that I get quite worked up about this because uh, I really love what we do. And I think it's amazing to watch God in action and to see the changes that he makes in these people's lives. But we believe we are an exciting program providing care for the whole person, for the body, the soul, and the spirit. Because, have you ever thought, we are unique in the whole of creation? So in Genesis we read that the animals and the birds of the air were made out of the dust of the earth. And so was man. But God breathed his breath of life into man and he became a living being, a soul. We combine both spirit and earth. We're unique. And God loves us. You know, and we've got to deal with people in the same way that God deals with us, body, soul, and spirit. So we deal with the body. We deal with the spirit. We deal with the soul. Because in the end, it's about making history. I always include this photograph. It's quite an old one now. It was taken in 2002. But that is the first Christian baptism in the Muslim village of Rodakal in Albania in nearly 600 years. That village, which was 100% Muslim, is now called the Christian village. Because the people embraced the gospel. Not because of what we said, but because of what we did. So what makes us a little bit different? Because you all know about sponsorship organizations. They're advertised on the TV. Um, that's one thing we don't do. We don't do any advertising. Because we believe that if you're giving money to kids, that's where you want it to go. We're not paying for a TV advertising campaign. But we remember where we started. And we started in that caravan 30, about 34 years ago now. And there were two American dental missionaries, Mac and Peggy McCowan. Uh, he was a retired engineer uh, and then retrained as a dentist. So I often wonder what, uh, what his uh, fillings were like, you know, how deep he went. <laughs> but they were there in that caravan in the Quiche Highlands, which then was even more remote than it is now in the middle of a civil war. And I bet they must have been thinking, Lord, why have you sent us here? But it was when he, they looked around and they saw these starving kids. Because most of the men were either dead or they were away fighting and the mums were trying to keep body and soul together. And very often in the mountains, when the food is tight, their basic diet is black beans and tortillas the mums would mix earth in with the black beans to make them go further. And very often they would not eat themselves so that their kids could have whatever they had. And at that time, 60% of the children were dying before the age of five. And that was just from lack of nutrition and basic medical facilities. So Mac and Peggy just started sharing their food with these kids. And the kids came to the caravan and word got out and more kids came. And they ran out of food and they ran out of money and they got in touch with their church and the church sent them money and they bought more food and it just sort of grew from that. And bit by bit, they started sending photos of the kids back to the church so that people could pray for them. And people said, well, I want, you know, I want to support this child. And that's how the sponsorship started. You know, it wasn't a planned thing. Well, it wasn't planned by us, but God had got his plan. And now we've just moved away from that. That's the, when we started in the 1980s, that was the wooden building that we put up so that we could feed the kids. Only problem was we were feeding not only the kids, but the local termite population. Um, and it reached the stage where you leant against the wall and just fell straight through because the, w the termites had eaten the inside of the wall. 
So we replaced that one uh, about 10 years ago with this steel and concrete building. And now we feed about 1,200 children at a time in that building. It's also there that we have the kitchens. And they prepare, oh, I think they prepare something like one million meals a year now. It's an awful lot of meals. And the ladies are in there from about 4 o'clock in the morning in this kitchen. And believe me, when you go in that kitchen, you think it's hot outside. It's really hot inside. But they're there every day. And every day they make about 8,000 tortillas by hand so that the kids can have something to eat. So we look after the body, the, the nutritionally designed meals, so that, because um, as I said, their basic diet is black beans and tortillas. Now, if you like me and vegetarian and you like black beans, that's great, no problem. It's a bit lacking in some, uh, in some minerals and nutrients. So what we do is we give them meat, either chicken or beef. Um, we give them rice with um, vegetables grated into it because they're not always used to having a lot of vegetables. They have uh, special drinks that are laced with uh, minerals and vitamins. And we sweeten it a bit so that the kids really love it. Um, they have the tortillas with them. You can't have a meal without tortillas. Um, you know, the kids come in and they eat. And um, I don't know about you lot, but when we were raising our kids, we had all sorts of things that they wouldn't have. You know, I don't want any peas. No Brussels sprouts for me, thank you. You know, I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like tomatoes. We went through one stage where one of our kids wouldn't have wet and dry on the same plate. That was a trying time. But these kids, they sit down in front of that food, and it's like watching vacuum cleaners. <laughs> That's it bowl full of food, gone. And then they go back and they ask for more. And as you can see from that picture, it's a serious business is eating. You know, that little lad, he's got two or three tortillas piled up on, his, on, a, on a cup there and they're eating. And uh, they do go back once or twice or three times or four times. We'll still give them food because we know that we only feed them twice a week because we don't want them to become dependent but we do want to give them the nutrition that they need to grow healthy and strong. Um, and very often when they go back for a second or a third or a fourth helping, um, they're secreting it away so they can take it home with them. But many of those kids, some of them live quite close to the program. I think the furthest that I know of is someone who walks three hours to get to a feeding centre. That, to me, says it all about their family circumstances. So at the moment, it's about 1.4 million meals a year. I have to keep updating that slide because more and more kids keep coming and we just keep making more meals. We provide medical care. Now, remember that doctor's face because I'm going to be saying something about him a little later. Um, but we provide medical care. We have three clinics um, and in the remote areas where people can't get to the clinic, we send out um, medical teams into the mountains. Um, we provide dental care. Um, we have uh, dentist clinics as well at all of the, at, uh, at three of the programs in the mountains and also in Albania. We also look after the spirit because we're there for body, soul and spirit. And for us, the most important thing we can do is give them the opportunity to hear about Jesus. And we do that through Bible teaching and through classes. Now, it's not a question of you sit through the class so you can get fed. It's a question of come and eat and here's an opportunity afterwards. Some of the programs, it's only 20% of the kids who go to the, uh, the classes. That's in one of the stronger Muslim areas in, in Albania. Other places, it's 80, 90%. It's not a compulsory thing, and we do not make it any. We don't make any suggestion that it is compulsory. It's just an opportunity for them to hear the gospel, because in the end, they have to hear it willingly. They have to respond willingly, just as we have. And then we look after the soul. I don't know about you, but I've known people who've backslidden because there hasn't been someone there just to be in support of them. 
Because when you're a new Christian, it's so easy to fall back into the old patterns, isn't it? And some of us who've been Christians a long time, some of us slip and fall. And we need people there who will support us, who will teach us, who will be there for us. And that's what we have with the discipleship training. Um, so all the kids have the opportunity to go through discipleship training after they accept Jesus. And many of those go on to become teachers and evangelists and pastors. All these kids became pastoral visitors or evangelists or the teachers on the program. And that's the team at the moment in, uh, in Zequalpa. And they will be going up into the mountains, meeting the families, finding out how the kids are going on and just generally sharing the gospel with people. But all of the people in that photo, every single one, was a child on the program. They accepted Jesus and they're on fire for him. They work in the slums in Guatemala City as well as up in the mountains in, um, in the Quiche. Remember we were saying that the mountains were about 8,000 feet up, Chichica? That picture is at Chichica. It looks completely different from the top of Ben Nevis. Ben Nevis is barren. There, trees grow and it's fertile and people have uh, farms. Um, see that area there? That is a farm. It's nearly vertical, but it's a farm because they will grow wherever they, they'll grow crops wherever they can because most of the farms are only about an acre and a half and it takes a lot of doing to feed a family off an acre and a half, even in a fertile country like Guatemala. We try to connect you on a one-to-one -one relationship so that people, so that the kids only have one godparent. See, kids like this guy here, Francisco René Gutierrez Aji. You need your teeth in to say that last name, don't you? Um, he comes from an area called Paso Hoch, and um, his, uh, his father has a very unstable home life and sort of seems to come and go and at the moment he's abandoned the family. Um, Francisco and his brother are under the responsibility of his grandparents um, and they make every effort to give the kids a better life. Granddad's a farmer, also works as a bricklayer. Grandmother's a housewife. Sometimes they receive some support from his mum who is working in the USA. These are broken families. There's a lot of addiction to alcohol in the mountains. And a lot of that is because of the Civil War. From 1960 to 1996, so that's 36 years, there was civil war. And most of it was concentrated in the mountains in the Quiche. And a lot of the guys, the only way they could cope was by drinking and forgetting. And I'm afraid that still goes on. So there's there is a problem with alcohol. There's also a problem with domestic abuse as well that is very closely tied to the alcohol. But we try to connect you with the kids on a one-to-one -one relationship. They call us padrino or madrina, godfather, godmother. And that's the sort of relationship that you can build up with the kids. Because we believe in people corresponding with the kids. Even if they can't read or write, the, uh, the letters you send are translated to them and then they'll give a reply and it'll come back. Uh, sometimes it can, be, um, it can be quite interesting reading the translations because it, uh, you write in English, it's translated into Spanish out in Guatemala, then it goes up into the mountains and the kids up there will speak a language called Quiche, which is very different from Spanish. It's an Amerindian language. Um, and then... The reply will be in Quiche, will be translated into Spanish and then back into English. And sometimes I think there may be just one or two slight distortions because in Quiche there are some, there are some things that there are no words for. So, for instance, if you're preaching the gospel in Quiche, you have to use Spanish words because there are concepts that, are, that just are not in the Quiche language. But we believe in people corresponding. And you can actually build up a very close relationship 
through these letters. Um, Sue's got a whole file of folder with uh, the very first girl that she started supporting when she was age four, wasn't it, Maria? She's now a young lady of 14. Um, pretty soon we'll probably lose her because uh, that's marriage age in Guatemala in the mountains. And very often that's the sort of age when the girls drop off the programs because they get married at 13, 14. We try to use your money wisely because it's not our money. At least 90% of all the money we receive goes straight out to the programs. It's one of the highest percentages um, in, in charitable work. Unfortunately, once you reach a certain size in this country as a charity, there are obligations laid on you by the, uh, by the government, which means you have to meet these requirements, which means you have to spend some money in the UK. Uh, we would prefer not to spend any money in the UK, but we can't get away with that. So at least 90% goes straight out to the mission field. We try to own all our own buildings. We do employ all our own staff. And that's so that we can be accountable for every penny that is spent. We don't work through anybody else. So that if you go out there, as I have quite a few times, you can go and see every program. You can go and see what a difference it makes in people's lives. You can go and look through the books if you want to. We've got nothing to hide. In fact, we were audited twice in Guatemala, once by the government, once by our own accountants. Every, month, every penny is accounted for. We believe in owning our own buildings because that gives us stability in an area. Because once we plant a program, it stays there. The program at Shishakol, the first program, has been there now 32 years. We're into the second, third generation. And we've seen the difference that it makes where we have the programs. We take groups out. Uh, you might rec even recognize two people in that photograph. Um, if I put my hat on, you'd definitely know it was me up in that photograph. And then my wife, Sue, is up there as well, and she's just sat over there. But we believe in taking folk out so that they can see what goes on. But best of all, you can get to meet the kids. And that is such an awesome thing to do, to actually meet them in their own home and to know what a difference you're making in their lives. Some of the programs we, ha we have now, um, we, we have three places called a refugio, which is where we open the programs, not just for the food, but also to give the kids a place of refuge uh, and a place where they can just go and be kids. Because many of them are working from the age of four or five upwards. It's difficult to be a child in Guatemala and we try to give them a place where they can just be children. Um, we have these uh, young youngsters, the ones dressed in green, they're called collaborators. Um, doesn't have the same connotation in Spanish as it does in English, but um, they are all kids of about 14, 15, 16, 17 who have accepted Jesus into their lives and want to work with the other young kids and share him. Um, and that's, uh, they're the kids who basically run uh, the refuges. And uh, there in the middle, um, you can see the latest recruit. It's called Juan, and it's a duck. Uh, and the kids of three and four and five think he's fantastic. But it allows us to preach the gospel in a way that they can understand and relate to. Um, the leaders up in the Quiche um, there are um, Martin and Gregoria. And Gregoria is the first Quiche lady to be qualified as a youth pastor. Um, which is quite something up in, in the Quiche because uh, the women are definitely second class citizens. And yet they hold the whole society together. Um, but Martine and uh, Gregoria, we blessed them, we sent them out to lead one of the refuge programs, and they are doing absolutely fantastic work with the teenagers and the younger kids as well. And then, of course, we work in, um, in Albania. We started there in 95. This is Rodokal, um, which, as I said, was a completely 100% Muslim village. That's the program at Rodokal now. 
um, custom built feeding program church um, flat for the pastor. That's their dental clinic, state of the art. And all the money for that clinic was actually raised by our charity shop in Northern Ireland. Uh, I think so far it's raised about a hundred thousand pounds over the space of about um, three or four years. And God just blessed us immensely through that. But it allows us to put in capital expenditure that we don't have to divert from anywhere else. Same pattern out in, uh, in Albania. We feed the kids, give them the opportunity to hear the gospel. We make it lively. I can never understand any preacher who sort of stands and preaches in a doer voice. You know, we've got a message of hope and salvation, a fantastic joy that Jesus came, died for us, and rose again. And that's the message we need to share with people. Not that he's this grim guy up in the sky, but he's somebody right there with us who loves us. That's the message we've got to share with people. And, you know, I, I can understand actually people who stand in the pulpit, because um, when I get excited, I've got to move. And how can you not get excited about God? And you know, how can you not get excited about Scripture? Because the Bible is the most exciting book in the world. You know, if you want mystery, drama, comedy, it's all there. But even more than that, it's got this message of salvation. And that's really what we need to share with everyone. And that's what we do. And as you can see, the kids get quite excited. It's when you go out there and they start singing their songs, I have, I'm one of those people who, if someone starts singing the wrong words, I can't remember the right ones. Do you know how it is? They start singing this song in Albanian, and I know I know it in English, but for the life of me, I can't remember the English words. But they're the, those people who can, you've got the kids singing in Albanian on one side, you've got the people who can understand, who can sing the words in English on the other side, and they're singing away, and then we've got our... German missionary, and she sings it in German. But it's all about making a joyful noise for the Lord, isn't it? But they enjoy their time. And as I said, Lodakal is now the Christian village. Because it's all about reaching people. You know, and it doesn't matter how old they are. It's all about reaching them, whether it's in Albania or in Guatemala. Both those pictures, by the way, were taken of people waiting to see the doctor or the dentist on uh, medical campaigns. We don't waste an opportunity to share the gospel with them. Sue works in the, um, in the National Health in our local hospital. And I, I, I once said to her, do you think we could get away with having a, um, you know, someone preaching to the, to the people while they're waiting in your waiting room? She said, I don't think we'd allow that. I thought, what an opportunity. While people are waiting to have their bodies saved, what about their soul? So we do that out in Guatemala and Albania. And we have these medical and dental outreaches. That lady there, she came and she wanted to know why we weren't making any charge. Why were we giving her free medical help? Because she'd never known that. Certainly not since the fall of um, um, since the fall of communism. Um, now they have reasonable medicine, but you have to pay for it. Before they had lousy medicine, but you didn't have to pay for it. I'm not sure which is the better option, but she was wanting to know why she didn't have to pay, and we said because it's free. Why is it free? Because that's what Jesus tells us to do. Why? Because he loves you. Why? Before she left. She'd accepted Jesus into her life as her saviour. And six weeks later, she went to heaven. It's never too late. It's never too early for people to know about Jesus. And I say we do it both in Guatemala and Albania. This is um, outreach in, um, in Guatemala with the medical team. Um, as you can see, the conditions are somewhat primitive, but people queue up to get this medical care because it's the only chance they'll get. Because in the end, it's all about relationships, isn't it? You know, the relationships that the staff have with the kids, the relationships that we have with the kids, but more important than that, the relationship that they can have with Jesus. Because our God is a God of relationship. 
You know, he's not a God of subjugation. He's a God who says, I'm your dad. Come on, son. Come on. It's about relationship. Because it transforms lives. Dr. Pablo, he was one of the kids at that caravan 34 years ago. He had a burning ambition to be a doctor. Not a chance for a little ragged kid in the keychain. But Mac and Peggy helped him, paid for his medical tuition, and he went on to become a doctor. He could have stayed in Guatemala City. He could have gone to the States. He could have made a, a really nice living for himself. Instead, he came back to the Quiche Mountains, and he lives in what Sue describes as a glorified um, garden shed. It's just four room, wooden rooms, shallow. He was one of the most humble, awesome guys I've ever met. There's Goyo. Goyo came to the program as a 13-year-old boy. He left his Kalashnikov at the door because he was a boy soldier. He was a boy rebel. He came to the program for a free meal. What he found was free salvation. And now he's our senior pastor in Guatemala. And he's just handed over responsibility for one of his churches to this young man who's 25, Wilmer. He's a man on fire for God. To hear him preach was just a privilege. He's now in charge of the church at Tunahan. Goyo is raising up pastors to take over from him. You know, he's not sort of saying, I'm in charge, I'm going to stay in charge, you're going to be under. He's raising them up because that's the pattern we should have, isn't it? To raise up the next generation, the next generation. It's so easy for us older ones, and I can classify myself as that nowadays because I have my bus pass. It's so easy for us older ones to sort of say, you know, well, I know better. No, we don't know better, we just know different. We need to raise up the next set of leaders. And that's what Goyo's done with Wilma. Both Goyo and Wilma were kids who found Jesus on the program. Because in the end, that's what it is for us. Ilya, he's our chief evangelist in Albania. Everybody in the area knows Ilya. He started life as, um, well, he was in the army. Um, we first took him on as a security guard because... Um, to put it politely in Albania, if it isn't nailed down, it disappears. And uh, he was one of the compound guards that we had. And we employed him because he was, he's not very tall, he's about the same height as I am, but he's built. You know what I mean? Built. And uh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to take him on. He is now our chief evangelist. You know, he was a strong arm guy. He's now a strong arm guy for God. But he isn't operating that way anymore. Jesus transformed him. Just as Jesus transforms us. I just slipped Kevy in because I had the privilege of presenting him with a certificate of baptism. He comes from a Muslim family. He had to accept he accepted Jesus as in, into his life. And it was just awesome to be able to pray over him and to thank God for the salvation that he accepted. Because God changes lives. We don't change lives. You don't change lives. God does. But we can be instruments. And that's what AAC is. Changing the world one child at a time. You know, and you can be part of it because there are, there are 4,000 kids on the programs who haven't got sponsors, but they get fed. They get the opportunity to hear the gospel. You know, guys like him, Francisco, that I talked about earlier. We'd love it if some of you became godparents. We've got lots of kids through there who so will only be too happy to nail you down and take your money off you. Because we're not afraid to ask for money. Because it's not our money. 
None of us have money of our own. It's all God's. We're stewards. Costs 18 pounds a month. I don't know about you, but 18 pounds a month is not a lot. When we had our kids, we used to go to McDonald's. Terrible thing to confess as a, as a good parent, isn't it? You know, we took our kids to McDonald's. <coughs> but it would cost us that much just for one meal. 18 pounds a month means the difference for these kids to a healthy life or possibly an early grave. But more than that, it gives them the opportunity to hear about Jesus and more importantly, to respond. Because that's what it's all about in the end. We can be well fed. We can be well educated. We can have all the riches of the earth. But if we don't have Jesus, we have nothing in the end anyway. These kids and their families need to know about Jesus. If you want to put it another way, it's 60 pence a day. We stopped having daily newspapers so we could afford another kid. Sue stopped having coffee when she went out shopping. And that was another child. There's lots of things that you can do that cost us nothing. But it's cost, it just gives them everything. It changes lives. Theirs, ours. But you can change your life today. you can help God change their lives as well. Thank you for listening. As I say, we've got lots of kids. Never without kids. We're going to close our worship now with uh, the song, I Am a New Creation. Because when Jesus comes into our lives, that's what we are.